All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I appreciate your patience. Um, the president of Fordham University, Father Joseph McShane, insisted that we start on Greek time, so we're starting a few minutes late. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, the Orthodoxy in America lecture, uh, delivered by a very good friend of ours uh, this evening. My name is George Dimakopoulos. I'm the Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Chair of Orthodox Christian Studies here at Fordham. I co-direct the center with my colleague, uh, Aristotle Papanikolaou, and I'll serve as the Master of Ceremonies this evening. So my first role, and my roles are very simple, my first role is to invite Father Michael Mick McCarthy of the Society of Jesus to offer our invocation. Father. As we prepare to consider the question of theological education in the 21st century, we might begin by pausing and listening to some verses of Psalm 32. I will instruct you, says the Lord, and show you the way you should walk, give you counsel with my eye upon you. Do not be a horse or mule without understanding. With bit and bridle their temper is curbed, else they will not come to you. Rather, I will instruct you, says the Lord, and show you the way you should walk, give you counsel with my eye upon you. So let us bow our heads and pray. O Lord our God, who has honored us with your own image, who has called us to holiness of life, and who has given us your Son as teacher and guide. Open our minds and hearts to your word. Grant us wisdom and learning. Allow us to recline, like the evangelist John, on the breast of Jesus, and draw therefrom light and inspiration. To your great glory, both now and ever, and to the ages of ages, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Um, as has become our custom in recent years, we invite very close friends of uh, the center to introduce our speakers. Um, and so this evening, we invite a very close friend who we've known for many years, um, Ms. Ann Glenn McCool, um, who is on the board of the International Orthodox Christian Charities. Uh, she's also uh, a delegate to the World Council of Churches from the Antiochian Archdiocese, or Patriarchate. So we invite Ann to introduce Father John. Well over a decade ago when Father John Baer was teaching at St. Vladimir's Seminary um, as a member of the faculty and I was serving on the seminary's board of trustees, the board initiated a search far and wide for a new dean for the seminary. We were mindful, of course, of the history of St. Vladimir's, the legacy from its founders and luminaries, the significance of the seminary's particular role in the Orthodox landscape. We hoped to find a person to assume leadership of the seminary as dean, able to honor that history, legacy, and role. It's no surprise in hindsight that our search led right around to our own front door when that board recognized in the young, brilliant, already world-renowned theologian the person for whom we had been searching. Father John bears inaugural address as dean to the seminary community in September 2007 telegraphed not only his sense of his undertaking leadership as dean, but also in a way of his life's work. Allow me to share the opening of that address, which Father John entitled, With Boldness and Without Condemnation. At the center of the divine liturgy, before we approach the cup to taste and see that the Lord is good, receiving his body and blood, becoming his body. 
We entreat God that we may dare with boldness and without condemnation call upon God as Father and say the prayer given to us by the Lord himself. To be able to call on God, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord of heaven and earth as Father is central to our identity as Christians, converted by the good news, putting on the identity of Christ by taking up the cross and being born again, receiving the spirit of the Father through Christ we are in this way able to call God our own Father, Abba even, so transcending the boundaries of our familial and social ties to become members of the household of God. One more line. If this prayer expresses our identity as Christian, then so too does the boldness that we, sorry, that we are granted. And it is our boldness not only to approach God in this manner, but one that extends to our whole bearing as Christians. Close quote. The boldness with which Father John cultivated the spiritual charter of the school, the integration of the pastoral and academic, the practical and scholarly, serving all of the Orthodox churches in this country while undertaking to address the church and the world, met the hope for his appointment and the promise of that first address. That was a time of great hope, a golden window of time for us who were at the seminary then. The spirit of that reflection with boldness and without condemnation continues to characterize Father John Baer in all of his ministry. We can see that same spirit imbues the Orthodox Christian Study Center here at Fordham and the efforts of professors Aristotle Papanicolaou and George Demacopoulos. George and Telly, Father John, and their international cohort of serious, faithful, brilliant Orthodox theologians and academics are wrestling with some of the most challenging issues of our time. Their work in Amsterdam, for example, and in Oxford this summer, in Romania, in Bose, to name just a few, demonstrates how important is their boldness and how important are these fora for gathering these minds harvesting their scholarship and sharing their wisdom. In a similar way tonight, we are gathered here with them. Given how long Father John's biography has become, let me offer a taste as a reminder to those who know Father John or have visited his website and to introduce him to you for those who don't. The very Reverend Professor Dr. John Baer is the Father George Florovsky Distinguished Professor of Patristics at St. Vladimir Seminary, where he served as dean from 2007 to 2017, the last such dean of the seminary, and the Metropolitan Callistos Chair of, the Orth of Orthodox Theology at the Vrij Universiteit of Amsterdam. We still hear in the cadence of his speech that Father John came to us from England, but his family background is Russian and German and clerical on both sides. From the Russian side, his great-grandfather was sent to London by Metropolitan of Logi to serve there as priest in 1926. His father was also a priest ordained by Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, as are his brother and brother-in-law. His maternal parents met at Karl Barth's graduate seminar in Basel and Sir Basel and served in the Lutheran church in Germany where his grandfather was a Lutheran pastor. After completing his first degree in philosophy in London in 1987, Father John spent a year studying in Greece, finished a master's of philosophy in Eastern Christian studies at Oxford under Bishop Callistos, who subsequently supervised his doctoral work which was examined by Father Andrew Louth and Rowan Williams, later Archbishop of Canterbury. While working on his doctorate in 1993, he was invited to be a visiting lecturer at St. Vladimir Seminary, where he's been on the permanent faculty since 1995, tenured in 2000 and ordained in 2001. Encouraged to fulfill the requirement of having a degree from an Orthodox institution prior to ordination, Father John completed a Master's of Theology at St. Vladimir's at the same time that he taught. So some classes found him sitting among the students and others standing before them teaching. 
before becoming dean in 2007. Father John served as the editor of St. Vladimir's Theological Quarterly, and he still edits the popular patristic series for SVS Press. His doctoral work was on issues of asceticism and anthropology, uh, anthropology focusing on St. Irenaeus of Lyon and Clement of Alexandria, and was published by the Oxford University Press. After spending almost a decade in the second century, Father John began the publication of a series on the formation of Christian theology, the way to Nicaea and the Nicene faith. Synthesizing these studies is the book, The Mystery of Christ, Life and Death, from SVS Press. In preparation for further volumes of his formation series, Father John edited and translated fragments of Diodor of Tarsus and Theodore of Mopsuestia, setting them in their historical and theological context. More recently, Father John published a more poetic and meditative book entitled Becoming Human, Theological Anthropology in Word and Image, and a full study of St. Irenaeus, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, identifying Christianity. Most recently, he has completed a new critical edition and translation of Origins on First Principles, together with an extensive introduction, and Saint and John the Theologian and his Paschal Gospel, a prologue to theology. He is currently working on a new edition and translation of the works of Irenaeus. These are just highlights, of course, and I will not detail his many, many articles and essays or positions on editorial and institutional boards. In August 2017, Father John was awarded a Doctor of Divinity Honoris Causa from the University of Divinity in Melbourne. And just days ago, the School of Divinity, History and Philosophy at the ancient University of Aberdeen in Aberdeen, Scotland announced Professor John Baer has been appointed as a professor in divinity and will be offering specialization in patristics and orthodox theology. In announcing this appointment, the University of Aberdeen noted that Father John, a prolific writer, is widely recognized as one of the world's leading scholars of early Christianity. So, after this academic year, off you will go, Father John, to watch the Tour de France and eat Stilton in Aberdeen as you grace that venerable institution. I admit to being sad that you will be far away, but I have a feeling that this new chapter of your life, after a quarter of a century here in the US, will provide a platform from which we all will be graced, as your scholarship and influence can only deepen. The University of Aberdeen is lucky to have you, you who are widely considered to be the most important historical theologian writing in English. Many consider Father John Baer to be the Callistos Ware of his generation. I am among these, thankful to have been given a lifetime that overlaps with his, to watch and read as his circles grow ever wider and influence ever deeper. It was an honor to have worked with Father John all those years ago, and is an honor to have been given the opportunity by the Orthodox Christian Studies Center of Fordham University to make this introduction this evening for this year's Orthodoxy in America lecture, Theological Education in the 21st Century. Please join me in welcoming Father John Baer. It really is a welcome honor <clears throat> to deliver this annual Orthodoxy in America lecture. And my thanks to President McShane, to Professors George Demacopoulos and Aristotle Papanicolaou, and all those involved with the Orthodox Christian Study Center at Fordham University for the invitation, and especially to Ms. Anne Glynn McCool for your really very kind and touching words of introduction. And it's also a welcome opportunity for me at this time, as it gives me an occasion to reflect on my work over the last quarter century and at a moment of transition to a different context. So theological education really is at the heart of the Christian faith. It goes back to the mandate of Christ himself. Go, therefore, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Now, when we hear this Great Commission, our attention is almost invariably captured by the words, go and baptize. But actually, in Greek, these words were participles, going, baptizing. It is the word, make disciples, rather, that is in the imperative. This is what we are to do with the going and the baptizing being the concomitant activities. Moreover, the word make disciples, mathetevsate, is not simply a matter of making new followers. It's a matter of teaching, making students, mathete, of the words. And this, furthermore, is not simply a matter of passing on information, making better educated Christians. The woman fleeing into the wilderness described in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, according to the second century writer Hippolytus, this woman is the church, and her child is the Christ, whom, he says, the church continually bears as she teaches all nations. So the church gives birth to Christ in the act of teaching. Theological education really has a high calling. Learning, then, it unfortunately has to be said, is essential for all Christians. In the Orthodox liturgy, we pray for growth in life and faith and spiritual understanding, and yet we prefer to spend our time studying anything else, politics, sport, education, uh, economics, whatever it might be, and then we too often wonder why our faith remains in a childish state. But that's not my topic for today. <laughs> I'll let bishops deal with that one. <coughs> Rather, my topic is much more specifically the higher level of theological education, preparing those who would be teachers. For as the apostle said, for equipping the saints and building the body, God has given some to be apostles, others prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. The words pastors and teachers in the grammar of that sentence is set together as a single office. It's not two distinct roles or even separate activities and I'm going to return to that later. So what then is involved in such theological education, in the preparation of those who are called to be teachers or pastors? And there are two, maybe three points that I want to make, just two or three. The first is the task of theology, or theology as a task. It's become ever more borne in on me over the last decades that the task of education is not to enable students to answer questions that arise today, but to be able to respond to those that will be raised in the decades to come as they mature over those decades in their own vocation. So if the questions that address us today are difficult in ways unimaginable only a few years ago, they will assuredly be even more difficult as the world changes at an increasingly rapid rate. So there is then a prophetic element to theological education. But to accomplish this, we have to be very clear about what the task of theological education is. And put simply, it is not about conveying information, but rather forming theologians, one who can speak in new and yet unforeseen contexts. So theological education does, of course, involve learning a lot, and indeed all sorts of disciplines. Some are more academic, such as the study of scripture, the fathers, patristics, my topic, history, systematics, liturgy, canon law, iconology, and then all the languages you need to be able to study that. Others are more pastoral, dealing with issues in pastoral ministry, counseling in various matters, sickness, old age, death, bereavement, addiction, and so on often involving extensive field work. And others are more practical still, such as rubrics, music, public speaking, preaching, all the different things that go into theological education. But in a very real sense, none of this is yet theology. Because each discipline can be and is taught by others, but not as theology. In fact, each of these disciplines, scriptural exegesis, patristics, liturgy, systematics or dogmatics, all the other disciplines, have now become disciplines in their own right, resulting in the fragmentation of the singular discipline of theology. 
Borrowing from Edward Farley in his study, Theologia, the Fragmentation and Unity of Theological Education, one could say, admittedly in broad strokes, that for the first millennium and more, theology was pursued by the contemplative reading of scripture in the context of the school of liturgy and the tradition of the fathers. But during the course of the second millennium, this pedia fell apart in both East and West. The practice of sacra pagina, the sacred page, became the discipline of sacra doctrina, sacred doctrine, in which passages of scripture were accumulated then in support of dogmatic points. And these dogmatic points took on a life of their own as a building blocks for dogmatic theology, resulting in the handbooks and textbooks that we all know of dogmatic or systematic theology. And then these books then provided the categories that were used for the studies of church history and the fathers. In turn, the study of scripture proceeded along other lines altogether, primarily if not exclusively in a purely historically oriented manner. Similarly, liturgy is now primarily studied as a history of liturgical practice, rarely if ever exploring, for instance, the way that scripture is used within hymnography as its own mode of scriptural exegesis. And all the other disciplines are equally studied separately. With this fragmentation of the discipline, of the singular discipline of theology, into these numerous discrete fields, those charged with theological education have focused, obviously, on the curriculum as a means of setting these different disciplines each with their own demands, alongside one another into a manageable package. While the coherence of theological education as teaching theology is rarely addressed. And then this has a knock-on effect of reducing the teaching of theology to the imparting of certain bits of information, or as is increasingly the case, teaching certain skills, leadership, financial management, people management, counseling, and all the other kind of skills which go into all of that. Now, information skills obviously are important, and a curriculum likewise is important and always in need of revision. But to understand theological education, we must go further and deeper and be clear about the nature of theology itself. Theology is not simply a matter of handing down information a static set of propositions, as if teachers of theology were simply UPS delivery persons handing over a package without having contributed anything to that package themselves. That's simply false and misunderstands the nature of theology. It's false, as even a simple reflection on the past century shows. Over the course of the 20th century, Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, went a, underwent a renaissance in many different ways. You have a liturgical renaissance, a revival of Eucharistic participation, a spiritual renaissance, a revival of the interest in the Jesus prayer, iconography, returning to ancient forms of uh, artistic forms, and especially theology and its teaching. Although the roots of this renaissance lie earlier, in the Kolivadi's movement on Mount Athos and Paisius Velichkovsky in Moldavia in the 18th century, then the Optina Fathers in Russia in the 19th century, the Moscow Council of 1917 1918, the context for the flowering of this Renaissance in the 20th century was largely in the West. It was here in the West that emigre theologians felt free to shake off the shackles of what Father George Florovsky famously described as the Western captivity of Orthodox theology. And by Western captivity, I have to be very clear, what he actually means is what was going on in the East, Western captivity. And what he means by that is a very scholastic form of teaching theology in the preceding centuries, 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th century in the East. It was, he says, borrowing a phrase from Spengler, a pseudomorphosis of its true nature into an alien form. But now, in the West, liberated from the Western captivity, Florovsky and the other emigre theologians entered upon a vigorous and highly productive new era in the rediscovery of Orthodox theology's true roots, done largely by returning to the Fathers, as, of course, many in the West were also doing. 
what's east and what's west is really perplexing in all of this. And all of that was then carried out in new institutional contexts, most notably St. Sergius Institute in Paris, St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York, Holy Cross in Brooklyn. Now, the style of orthodox theology developed in this way became all but ubiquitous in the latter part of the 20th century, so much so that it simply assumed to be the orthodox tradition of theology. But given the disjunction between this renewed vision of theology and the previous centuries, a disjunction which is inscribed in the very proclamation of its renaissance, theologians knew that they could not simply claim that all they were doing is handing down untouched what had been handed down to them. And so they insisted in the characteristically elegant words of Metropolitan Callistos that tradition is not simply a repetition, but a creative fidelity. Words which thereafter, however, were merely and frequently and ironically, but without any real sense of irony, repeated. And these words have morphed more recently, as Professor Demacopoulos has pointed out, into the odd and untraditional and sectarian even phrase, traditional orthodoxy. So to say then that the teachers simply hand down without any contribution what they have received is simply false. It's also, as I said, fundamentally misguided in regarding the nature of the discipline of theology. And reflecting a little further on this renewed form of orthodox theology in the 20th century will take us further into understanding the discipline. So the fruit of the return of the fathers in the past century was most often expressed in terms of a neo-patristic synthesis. Drawing together various elements of the fathers into a synthesis, presenting the, the orthodox dogmatic or systematic theology. And this was done primarily from the perspective of the end, or the high point of patristic theology, with the figure of St. Gregory Palamas. And so the neo-patristic synthesis regularly took the form of a neo palamism for which we now have a really wonderful new study by Norman Russell entitled Gregory Palamas and the Making of Palamism in the Modern Age. It's neo palamism because, in fact, Palamas himself was not taught in orthodox ecclesial institutions in the preceding centuries. And in many ways, in fact, this neo-Palamism of orthodoxy in the 20th century stood alongside neo-Thomism as a means of self-differentiation in the common task engaged in by both Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, the common task of returning to the fathers but making a point of differentiation. One could also perhaps consider the striving for a neo-patristic synthesis as a historically situated example of modernity's desire for a systematic theology. Because this kind of synthesis or systematization is not characteristic of the first millennium. It is a modern phenomenon. Rather than synthesis, a better image, I would suggest, to adapt an an image used by St. Irenaeus, a better image would be symphony. To use technical language, a symphony is synchronically and diachronically polyphonous. That is, it's comprised of different voices at any one moment and throughout time, each lending themselves to the melody being played with different timbres and tonalities, different inflections and themes, and each of them, in turn, being shaped by the symphony. So St. Basil and St. Gregory of Nyss in the fourth century, they have different voices. Despite being brothers, and despite our predilection for speaking about Cappadocian theology as if it's a monolithic whole. Neither are St. Irenaeus in the second century or St. Maximus in the seventh century identical. Although there are striking simil strikingly similar themes, they are played out with very different vocabularies and different philosophical frameworks. Yet all of these figures were each part of the same symphony with all the diachronic and synchronic diversity that this entails. A symphony does not reduce each voice to a monotony, 
nor to a consensus. See, people like to talk about the consensus of the fathers. Well, such a consensus of the fathers would really be the lowest common denominator. Each voice must be heard in its full particularity, and in its full particularity contributes to the polyphonous nature of a symphony. Speaking theologically, moreover, this symphony is not, therefore, constructed by any individual voice, or even by all the voices together, but it's gov governed by its own rhythms and its rules. So to continue with Irenaeus, he says, it is God who harmonizes the human race to the symphony of salvation. So reading the fathers, reading the tradition symphonically in this way, attunes us to the melody that is theology. But rehearsing the symphony as it's been played to this date is not yet, however, to do theology. If you want to take part in a symphony, what you must first do is read the score of the earlier movement, especially the earliest where the symphony is given shape and set going. But theology proper only begins when having read attentively through the score of the earlier movement, we then take our own part in the ongoing symphony. So we don't read the earlier score simply to stockpile quotations to buttress what we think we already know and to tear down others. Rather, we rehearse the symphony so that we ourselves can be harmonized into the symphony and so take our part today to sing that symphony with new voices. With new voices, yet with themes and movements that might well be different from what went before, yet part of the same symphony. Because we must sing in the present, addressing the concerns of the present, and using the language of the present, if we're going to have anything to say and any hope of being heard. Now, a further question then arises. And I suspect that the response to this question will be the movement of the symphony of theology in the 21st century. And that is, how is it that we are able to hear the diverse voices of the fathers of the tradition as a symphony rather than a cacophony? And this takes us deeper into the issue I raised before, that of the coherence of the discipline of theology as theology. So to keep with a, th with a theme of symphony, I would suggest that perhaps this is only possible if we return to the idea of canon as it was expressed in the early centuries, and being very precise about what it means. So according to Clement of Alexandria, a writer in Alexandria at the end of the second, beginning of the third century, he says, the ecclesiastical canon is the harmony and symphony of the law and the prophets in the covenant delivered at the coming of the Lord. The canon, the guiding rule for theology, is this symphony and harmony of the law and the prophets, what we now misleadingly call the Old Testament, misleadingly, delivered in the coming of Christ. This is exemplified by Christ himself, for instance, on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, when he opens the scriptures to show how Moses and all the prophets spoke about how he, the Son of Man, had to suffer to enter into his glory, and he was then known in the breaking of the bread only to disappear from sight, and he disappears from sight because we are his body. So these two points, the opening of the scripture and the breaking of the bread, opening of the scripture to show how the law and the prophets speak about how the crucified and risen Christ um, is, is there throughout the whole of the scripture, and then known in the breaking of the bread. What's interesting is that these two elements are, importantly, the only two elements for which the Apostle Paul uses a really technical, authorial, authorizing formula. He only uses it twice when he says, I delivered to you what I received or I traditioned to you. This is what the tradition is. I traditioned to you what I received. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, in the night in which he was given up, he took bread, broke it. And then 1 Corinthians 15, he died in accordance with Scripture, he was raised in accordance with Scripture. This is what is traditioned by the heavenly apostle, and it's given as an ongoing task. 
So scriptural exegesis and liturgy form a common unity regulated by the same canon, which then guides the contemplative reading of scripture in the school of liturgy. And this is then reflected upon, articulated in different ways, in different epochs. The, uh, speaking of Paul, the Apostle Paul doesn't use the word canon, but he points to the same thing when he urges Timothy. He says, hold on to the pattern of sound words. The pattern of sound words. Too often today, theology has not been holding on to the pattern of sound words, but has become the pattern of familiar words. We think we talk like theologians because we can use these long words. In other words, if we want to understand the coherence of theology as theology, we don't start at the end of what we think the high point was, such as Palamas, as he came to be read and valued in the last century, but rather we must return, as St. Polycarp urges us, return to the word delivered in the beginning, and so learn to speak the language of theology, to take part in that symphony. As Rowan Williams reminds us, he says, theology is perennially tempted to be seduced by the prospect of bypassing the question of how it learns its own language. We're tempted to forget how we learned how to speak. It should also be noted that when the appeal to the canon was first made in early Christianity, it was not as a set of informational propositions that must simply be maintained, repeated, without our own articulation. The word canon fundamentally means a straight line, a guideline. And as Aristotle already pointed out, and I mean the Greek philosopher, not Professor Papa Nicolaou, <laughs> as Aristotle pointed out, unless we have a straight line, we cannot determine what is straight and what is crooked. So the point of a canon, and then later on the creeds, is not to curtail thought. The point of a canon is not to mark out what is untouchable dogma and what is heresy, and perhaps leave a gray area for thinking or speculation, the so-called theologumena. No, the point of the canon is not to stymie or delimit thinking. The point of the canon is to make thinking possible. Without a canon, without a regular, a rule, without a straight line, we would not be able to think at all. So the ancient philosophers knew, every area of thought needs its own canon. It needs a criterion, a guideline, regulating its discourse. And I, as I've suggested, for Christian theology, this is found in the opening of the script, scriptures in the light of Christ's passion and the breaking of the bread in and through which we become his body. Once again, the point of the canon is not to stymie thought or reflection, but to make it possible. And not simply possible as an enterprise we might or might not take up, but one that we have to take up as a task, the task of theology. We must be ready to give a good account of the hope that is in us to all those who ask, as the Apostle Peter demands of us. It's for this freedom to think that we've been set free, to be able to respond to our own situation as part of that ongoing symphony of theology. Now, it's sometimes argued that responding to, or even listening to, questions raised today is dangerous, that dialogue contaminates and leads to distortion. Well, quite simply, it's not as dangerous as stopping thinking that for which the canon is there to make possible. Nor is it as dangerous as letting our own psychological baggage define what we think the symphony is. There's a definite ascetic element to theology, as there is in any academic discipline, allowing our own presuppositions to be brought to light and exposed for what they are. Rather, um, rather than redefining the symphony according to our own psychological baggage, our own bruises or fears, as too often happens, we are to be harmonized into that symphony so as to be able to sing in the present. So if we start from the idea of this canon that guides the formation of theological discourse, then I would argue we can see the modern fragmentation of theology into a number of discrete fields that I mentioned earlier, 
not as a cause for lament, but as an opportunity for being enriched. Because this modern fragmentation from the Enlightenment onwards has resulted in a phenomenal amount of scholarship expended in each field, erudite volumes produced, and a depth of knowledge attained. And in this way, through disciplined, rigorous, academic study to the highest level we're capable, the spell of a monotonization, a monotonous harmonization of history in a fixed synthesis constructed from our own place in history, that spell is broken, and we can begin again to hear each historical witness faithfully, and in so doing, be more fully harmonized into that symphony. So what we have before us, or rather behind us, is a history of concrete, historically situated Christians bearing witness to and embodying their faith in Christ until he comes again, a witness now embodied in texts and available to us as texts understood in the context of liturgy. So the sight of a theologian is both undoubtedly historical and hermeneutical and inescapably exegetical. We stand between the definitive act of God in Christ and his return, patiently and dialogically learning to hear the word of God, to encounter the risen Christ in the opening of the scripture and the breaking of the bread, in a history of witnesses to this encounter and a tradition of such practices. And in so doing, we become harmonized to the symphony that they have sung and be able to sing our own part in our own way today. Okay, the second point I'd like to make is that the task of theology is transformation. Transforming our vision so that we might ourselves be transformed. Theology is not simply, as I've said, a matter of handing down untouched informational propositions, but it's a task of transforming our vision so as to see everything in the light of Christ. So take, for example, the figure of the Martyr Blandina. And I know people who've heard me talk before know that I always mention Blandina. She really is my favorite. I wanted, in fact, to name my daughter after her, but my wife said, no way. <laughs> Just think how it would be shortened, Bland Blandini or something like that. No. The Martyr Blandina. She's put to death in the arena in the late second century in Lyon. She's a young female slave, the weakest of the weak in the ancient world, but therefore also the supreme vessel of the power of God, for his strength, as Christ tells Paul, is made perfect in weakness. Writing about her trials, Irenaeus reports how the guards, after having assailed her for days, admitted that they were defeated while she remained steadfast. Then finally, she was hung up upon a stake and offered as food for the wild beasts. And then Irenaeus continues. He says, She, by being seen hanging in the form of a cross, by her vigorous prayer, caused great zeal in the contestants, the other Christians in the arena, as in their struggle, they beheld with their outward eyes, through the sister, him who was crucified for them. So that he might persuade those who believe in him that everyone who suffers for the glory of Christ has forever communion with the living God. So not only is she the supreme vessel of the power of God, but now in her departure, she actually embodies Christ himself. But note, it's only those contestants in the arena alongside her who are able to look at her and see him who was crucified for them, not those sitting in the seats of the amphitheater. What they would have seen was a young girl being butchered for their amusement. We must be in the arena, not onlookers in the stand. And then, in fact, to be more accurate, it's the author of the letter, St. Irenaeus, who's able to see this. He, with his theological vision, grounded in the canon, the opening of the scriptures in the light of Christ, to see Christ, and so understand the whole economy of God from beginning to end, from Adam to Christ, from male and female to neither male and female, but rather a living human being in the stature of Christ, it's he who's able to look at this scene of brutality and carnage 
and see the very embodiment of Christ himself in Blandina. And by doing that and writing that, he enables us now today to see her as the embodiment of Christ, which is something we would not likely have seen had we been there on the day. So he's given us a verbal icon of the martyr, not simply a photograph. And it is in this transformation of vision that resides the pastoral dimension and the power of theology. So when we speak of pastoral theology, we cannot allow it to be reduced to that which is taught by those in the field of, say, social work. Any more than we can allow the more abstract aspects of theology, such as systematics, to avoid its pastoral dimension. That would take us straight back to the problem of fragmentation. Rather, the pastoral dimension of theology as a unified discipline lies in opening our minds in the light of Christ to a full theological vision and so be able to communicate that transformed and transforming vision to others. And what we see when we look with a theologically shaped vision is best expressed by Paul in his letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 8, he says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing, the apocalypse of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail together until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we await for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we are saved. So the chaos, the suffering, the pain, the decay, the death which fills this world in which we live, in fact, in the light of Christ, turns out to be the birth pangs of creation, laboring in travail, giving birth to the children of God. That's a transforming vision theology has to offer, and which gives it its power and its pastoral dimension. And then this, in turn, offers a much more expansive vision of the church and the task of evangelism. Irenaeus continues his account of Blandina by describing how she and a young man called Atullus were finally put to death. In his words, as he puts it, through their continued life, meaning their death, the dead were made alive, and the martyrs showed favor to those who had failed to witness. And there was great joy for the virgin mother in receiving back alive those whom she had miscarried as dead. For through them, the majority of those who had denied were again brought to birth, again conceived, and again brought to life, and learned to confess and now living, the martyrs, they're dead, now living and strengthened, they went to the judgment seat. So the church is the mother of martyrs, those who through their witness, the word witness and martyr is the same word in Greek, through their witness become living human beings. This maternal dimension of the church, which is such a pervasive feature of early Christian theology, is something that is strikingly absent for most modern ecclesiology, especially orthodox ecclesiology. Over the past century, ecclesiology has primarily been seen in terms of the Eucharist, where the Eucharist, there is a church, Eucharistic ecclesiology. That's one of the fruits of the renaissance of theology I spoke about. But this Eucharistic ecclesiology has, I would argue, subtly morphed into an episcopal ecclesiology. Evidence for this is the way in which the words of St. Ignatius are frequently misquoted. I love asking bishops. Ignatius says, where the, where the bishop is, almost invariably they'll answer, there is a church. What Ignatius in fact says is, where the bishop is, let the people be present, just as where Jesus Christ is, there's a church. You can't miss out the people, you can't miss out Jesus Christ. That's not good. Okay. <laughs> And so, in morphing from an Eucharistic ecclesiology to an Episcopal ecclesiology, our ecclesiological questions have come to focus ever more on territory and hierarchy. 
And likewise, evangelism is understood as a kind of religious or cultural imperialism, extending the borders of our institutions and increasing our membership. So to return to the text with which I began, if our task is Christ's injunction to make students, with going and baptizing being the concomitant activities, not the imperative, and if teaching theology, as I've tried to outline in this talk, is a task of transforming our vision to the point where we can see with Paul the whole of creation as groaning in travail, giving birth to the children of God, living human beings who in their witness and martyria embody or incarnate Christ, so that the church is, as Hippolytus put it, always giving birth to Christ, then we have a much more expansive vision of the church and a much higher understanding of the task of theology and evangelism, teaching. Okay, the third point I want to mention, just briefly, is institutional context. I mentioned earlier that the renaissance of orthodox theology in the 20th century was bound up with the founding of new educational institutions some 70 years ago or so. These were the primary institutions within which orthodox theologians almost exclusively worked and taught in the past century. Over the last decades, however, there's come to be an increasing number of orthodox theologians and orthodox scholars in other related disciplines working in universities, in colleges, in academia more generally. And indeed, orthodox centers established, most notably, of course, the center here at Fordham University. Now, some have cast this in oppositional terms, that orthodox scholars working within the broader academy are somehow working outside the bounds of the church, engaged more freely in what some people call speculative theology. I don't know what that is, but never mind. As opposed to seminaries, which as ecclesial institutions are bound more to churchly theology. Well, that really is a false opposition and one which, in fact, betrays the vision of those who founded the Orthodox schools in the West. In what could be called the founding charter of these schools is found in the report for the Church in Russia on Theological Education in America, written in 1913 by the then Father Leonti Tukevich, who was the dean of the school that was then in Tenafly, New Jersey, later became the Metropolitan of the Metropolia and the Dean of uh, Rector of St. Vladimir's Seminary. He wrote a report about theological education um, as it was being carried out in America for the church in Russia. Rather than the, the division of theological education, as had been the case in Russia, between the seminaries which were focused on preparing country priests and the academies where higher theological education was given to those who were preparing to become leaders in ecclesial administration, Leonti outlined with a truly prophetic voice what should be the characteristics of theological education in the new world. A world in which, in his words, the American Orthodox Church would be the avant-garde of orthodoxy in general, and the theological school of the local church would be a serious avant-post of orthodoxy. And to carry out this high role, he insisted, it's necessary that there be in America theological scholarship of the highest level because, as he put it, remember 1913, a priest serving in this country, he said, does not have the right to refuse a decent basic answer about the significance, aims, and problems of the church as well as a true relationship of orthodoxy to non-orthodoxy. Then he carries on. Without this the serious theological foundation, our work, he said, will always be likened to a sectarian game. It becomes merely sectarian if it's not this. And then, with equal insight, he insisted that this kind of education would have to transcend the opposition between pastoral and academic, practical and scholarly, and unite both of these necessary activities to provide an apostolic type of formation. He then went on to have all sorts of speculations about the curriculum, which included hygiene, but there we go. <laughs> uh, by which I think he actually meant medical practice. Doc uh, priests in country Russia would often be called upon as doctors and had some learning, they could, they could do that. Uh, I don't think we've ever taught hygiene at St. Vladimir's Seminary, <laughs> although maybe it's time. <laughs> 
So having reflected further this evening, to, to wrap up then, having reflected further this evening on the nature and task of theology, we can perhaps now have a fuller understanding of the kind of formation and ministry that Leonti was talking about. To reduce theological education to anything less is to betray its high calling and to fall into sectarianism. That orthodox theology is being taught outside the seminaries and universities and colleges, sometimes with their own centers, is not a, a cause for concern or castigation, but for rejoicing. It's evidence of the vitality of theology. That orthodox theologians are willing to tackle contemporary concerns and issues with a creative fidelity that Metropolitan Kalistos wrote of, not as repetition, but a new stage in the symphony of theology, should be celebrated, using the words that Anne referred to earlier, the words of the prayer before the Lord's Prayer, with boldness and without condemnation, although there is too often too much of the latter. What kind of institutions there will be for teaching theology in the future remains to be seen. Institutions come and go, as history teaches us, especially when they betray their mission and their identity. But what will not disappear, however, is that tradition, that symphony of theology that I've been speaking about. Thank you. Or not. So either everything was so clear, so self-evident, <laughs> or you haven't understood a word I've been saying for the last hour. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to assume it's the former, but I'm also happy to take questions at the back. Oh, sure. Well, we all have psychological baggage, yeah? Um, but we've got to be very careful to be aware of what it is and how it's affecting us and how it's leading us in certain directions or not, okay? Um, and that's especially the case in theology and in church life, okay? They can be led wildly astray by all sorts of baggage uh, that, that comes to the fore and all these things. But also, on the other hand, it is simply a matter of academic discipline, yeah? You know, academic discipline, learning a different discipline, whatever it might be, will expose our own presuppositions, yeah? um, which may be, may be right, may be wrong, but it expose our presuppositions. The unexamined life is not worth living, going back to Plato. Yeah? So all of that. Um, there's a really good book written on that called John the Theologian is Paschal Gospel, a prologue <laughs> to theology. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, the Son of Man is simply a Semitic idiom meaning a human being. Okay? So uh, the vast number of cases of Christ's words about the Son of Man in the Gospels, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. It's a, you know, the human being is a self-referential way of talking, okay? But through the work of, uh, through the prophetic books of Daniel and e Ezekiel, the Son of Man comes to be seen as an apocalyptic character. The Son of Man is the one who comes from heaven, yeah? And what's really interesting about that, and this is why we've got to be so careful to read these texts really carefully, especially the way that... Um, we've tended to systematize theology and then take that as our starting point and not look at how words are actually being used. So today in theology, we tend to take Son of Man as being a designation of Christ as human, Son of God as Christ as divine. But in, in fact, scripturally, Son of Man is a higher title. Yeah? We are all sons and daughters of God. Yeah? Um, I say you are gods, sons of the Most High, the psalmist says, yet you'll die like a human being. Okay? So scripturally, that's the way that language is used. And the title Son of Man is a more elevated title. The Son of Man is the one who comes from the heaven upon the clouds.
mentioned, uh, oh, thanks. You mentioned a canon, and yeah. um, returning to this idea of, of the patristic uh, notion of a canon in order to uh, enter into a symphony. Yeah. And I guess I'd love to hear a little more about that word and, and how it was used in the early church. Um, yeah. My question is just sort of how do I know whether I'm participating symphonically or whether I'm in a Stravinsky, you know? <laughs> I like Stravinsky, but you know yeah. what I mean. Um, so the word canon, I really want to emphasize that because the word canon in modern parlance tends to mean a list of books. We talk about the canon of scripture meaning a list of books. Well, it was never used that way until I think it was 1782. Okay, that's the first time the word canon was used to refer to a list of books. The word canon, um, I gave you the definition of Clement of Alexandria. The ecclesiastical canon is a symphony and harmony of the law and the prophets in the parousia affected by the coming of the Lord. Okay, in the covenant brought about by the coming of the Lord. Um, in Irenaeus, you have uh, an appeal to the canon by which you're able to restore the mosaic which had been a picture of a king and return, distort it into a picture of a fox, return it to a picture of a king. If you know the canon, you're able to restore the, the jewels to, the, to its own proper place. And he, when he speaks about the canon, he will give um, beliefs. One God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, one Holy Spirit, the basis of our later creed. So it's a continuous idea behind that. But in order to fully get to it, I've got time? Okay. In order to fully get to it, we have to introduce another term, and that would be hypothesis. Okay. Hypothesis is a fundamental presupposition which every discipline has, which guides the work of that discipline. Okay. Um, and ultimately, you cannot prove a hypothesis. The hypothesis, even Epicurus pointed out, hypothesis is accepted on faith. If you could prove it, you'd have to prove it by reference to a further starting point. You'd end up in infinite regress and so on. So the canon fundamentally is a, um, a verbalization of the hypothesis. Okay. Now, to make all of that more intelligible, let me give a, um, a, 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 an analogy. And I've used the analogy in a slightly different way before. Um, my wife used to ask me where I'd put the different fathers on a football team, a you know, soccer team. Okay. You know, and you would obviously put, I don't know, uh, Irenaeus in defense, Epiphanius in attack, Jerome in attack. You would put Dionysus out on left field somewhere. Um, <laughs> You know, and Origen, to, to, to finish that point, Origen was a schoolboy who picked up the ball, invented the game rugby. He got kicked off the team, but everybody <laughs> played rugby thereafter. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, with, with regard to the idea of canon, you often hear people saying that you've got to interpret Scripture according to the canon. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard that expression. That's meaningless. It's completely meaningless. It's a, it's a conflation of categories. How would you interpret a passage, I don't know, Leviticus chapter 17, according to the canon? It's meaningless. Okay? So think about it as a soccer game. If you want to learn to play soccer, what do you do? You watch the game, and you get a sense of how the game works, and then you get on the field and you play with those who know how to play. Yeah? You don't learn to play the game soccer by reading the rule book and then getting on the, on the field, never having seen a game, and just trying to enact it. Okay? So the game, the, 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 the soccer, game of soccer has got a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis of the game. To learn it, you've got to have a sense of that hypothesis. You then get on the field and you play with those who know how to play. Yeah? And you start kicking the ball and doing all the rest of it. At a certain point, as you start to learn how to play, you may well then go and read the rule book, and that will add to your knowledge of what you're already doing. Okay? But it's not that you can learn how to play by reading the rule book. And then, as a game is played, certain things might happen. Somebody kicks a ball or picks up the ball and runs with it, and then you've got to decide, is this move, the offside rule, for instance, whatever that is, this offside rule, is it in accordance with the canon or not? And so through the course of history, more... Uh, specification is added to the canon as a verbalization of the hypothesis of the game. Yeah? So likewise with scripture, if you want to know how to interpret scripture, you've got to work with those who know how to interpret scripture. Yeah? 
and those would be the fathers we're, re we're reading through the course, um, and those who can teach the fathers in that way. Okay? And then you'll get a sense of what's involved with all of this, and then you can read the canon and get a greater sense of what's going on. Um, and then from time to time, new questions emerge which require different kind of answers. And so the rule book, if you like, gets longer, but the hypothesis hasn't changed. Does that make sense as an analogy? Yeah, the, okay. 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 Please join me in thanking Father Brown. It's now my great honor to introduce to you uh, the president of Fordham University, the Reverend Joseph N. McShane of the Society of Jesus. Thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, <laughs> you're very tall. Uh, <laughs> Unfair, unfair. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank all of you for coming this evening uh, for this, uh, this series, this lecture in the series that we have hosted with great joy here at Fordham for a number of years now. Uh, at the outset, then, I also want to, I want to thank Telly. Uh, where's Telly? Telly is in the back, all right, and George in the front. They have all the exits covered, in other words. Uh, I want to thank them for bringing uh, the center to life. It was your dream, and you have realized it wonderfully. Uh, I'm not through with the two of you. Uh, when I came in this evening, I, I, was, I was just struck at you know, how wonderful it is that George and Telly are here. But then I was, uh, I was reminded of the wisdom of beware of, of Greeks uh, <laughs> bearing gifts. But in your case, it was, this is wonderful. We're getting ready to come in the door, and uh, George and Telly have set me up you know, thank you. Oh, this is wonderful. This is a terrific thing. And uh, so I, I learned the other side of the equation. Beware of Greeks asking for gifts. Because as I was walking in, having been set up, they said, now, Father, we want you to know everyone agrees with us we need space. Thank you very much. Uh, so if you get me a building, you've got the space. All right? So if there are Greeks here are looking for a worthy cause, what can I say? That would be it. That's the first. Second, Father, I have to tell you, soccer, you know, it's a very interesting analogy. But you've got me thinking. You know, it's the end of the season. The Yankees, God's elect, are, uh, you know, they've already clinched the division. They may, they may be back in, you know, uh, in Beulah land very soon, uh, otherwise known as the World Series and victory there. So I was thinking, could you put your mind to the great task of using baseball as the analogy? What would be, what would be the, who would be the guy who would bunt? Uh, who would be the 20 game winner? Who is, who is really the equivalent of Derek Jeter? Um, I mean, what theologian would you assign to these tasks? Uh, and who is the all important guy? Who is the catcher? Who is the, the real field manager? for the whole thing. Is it Augustine? I don't think in the Greek, in the, in the East, no. He's, he's actually the, the coach of the opposing team. Uh, <laughs> let, let, us be, let us be honest for that one. And, and you're not sure if it's Basil or Athanasius who is the coach for the home team. Uh, and I know that you're torn on that. But I'd ask you to do that because that, you know, everyone was laughing, but really, you know, to go along with you. They have no idea what soccer is. So uh, <laughs> if you did this with baseball, it'd be great. Uh, <laughs> this is true, isn't it? Uh, but, you know, I, I have to say, the reason I did that was, Father, you were excellent. You were extraordinary. You were, uh, you were clear. You were engaging. You were so at home with your material that you could literally back away from it and zoom in on it. You treated it with reverence, but with the humor that showed tremendous familiarity with what you were talking about. You spoke from experience, you spoke from the heart, therefore you spoke with loving wisdom about the transmission of the wisdom of love. 
So I want to thank you on behalf of everyone here. And I thought I would be playful with you because you were engagingly playful with a whole tradition uh, because I think that you feel that it is important to keep the tradition alive by not making it just tradition, but rather the living faith that has been handed down to us. So thank you very much, and I want you, uh, it, it's sad for me to think that you're leaving metropolitan New York. You may not like the metropolitan here, but it's sad that you're leaving metropolitan New York and going to Scotland. I hope you come back often and uh, you'll stay long. And when you come back, I want you to come to Fordham. We have a gift for you, for you to remind you, and we'll bring it to you. George, you're the Greek. Give the gift. Bear the gift. Second gift I want to give uh, to a woman with a name that I, uh, you know, I find irresistible. You know, uh, Ms. Glyn McCool. You know, in, in, of course, among the Irish, it's Finn McCool. Uh, and you're Glyn McCool. Your introduction was, uh, was also filled with affection for the church, for the speaker, for the tradition, and for the work. Uh, you spoke from the heart, uh, and uh, you had everyone in the, uh, in the palm of your hand. So I, I want to thank you for introducing a great speaker with such a fine introduction filled with love, wisdom, uh, and devotion. Uh, and you, now I'm intrigued, World Council of Churches, where? <laughs> She's good. She's good. And she would say ecumenical in the world, you know, the whole world. Not just part of the world. But where is the headquarters? Geneva. Geneva. All right. So I thought you're not up at, at, uh, at the God box. Um, oh, no, they're long gone. That was the National Council. National, but I thought they also had. They did for, for many years. But it's gone. Yeah. It's long gone. They've left the God box um, to go to Geneva. All right, very good, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and you'll come back anytime. You know we have a lecture. I hope. All right, is that all right? Yeah. If I can say that I expect you, George again. Do yes. the. Okay. Last things, if I could. First, uh, you know the uh, the whole center. The idea was conceived by George and Telly. Uh, but it was brought into life, brought to life by the generosity of, of many of our friends and donors. In a special way, I want to acknowledge tonight, even in their absence, many of those donors, and especially the Pattersons, uh, who really were the first to believe in the vision that George and Telly had, and their example of generosity uh, has inspired others to help us. So uh, I want to ask of you, uh, not applause for them, I want to ask for something much greater. I want you to pray uh, tonight. Be, you know, on the way home, or before you go to bed, I want you to, to pray in thanksgiving for the great gift that they have given the university and to the church and churches uh, through their, their generosity. And what is that gift? A place where serious matters involving the theology of East and West can be discussed with respect and affection uh, in, a, in a, I would say, a rich intellectual setting. That, you may think, is no great feat it is a very important thing that happens here. And as Father John's uh, lecture tonight made very clear, it's very important that we keep this alive and that we keep the dialogue alive. So I'd ask you to, to remember them in your prayers. I also ask you to remember in your prayers all the students uh, from the Eastern churches who are with us uh, here at Fordham studying at the Jesuit University of the Capital of the World. Just slip that in. Um, because we believe that they are their gift to us we want them to continue to come, whether they be Greek or uh, Serbian or Russian or Ethiopian, Copts. Uh, I want them all to feel at home here because this is where we believe East meets West and uh, with great, great insight uh, draw closer together so that ultimately the Lord's own dream comes true, that there be one flock and one shepherd, which is what we all pray for. Last but certainly not least, before I invite you to pray your grace, uh, I want you to come forward. Tonight you are the hierarch in the place. 
Tonight you were unfairly attacked by Father, Father John <laughs> as being a believer in merely an Episcopal form of church or ecclesiology. I know that that's not the way you feel at all. You know, I know that. And you whispered to me that you're much more Lutheran than you are <laughs> because you believe that the church is where the word is rightly preached and the sacrament rightly administered. Right? And so I don't think that uh, Lutheranism is a fine thing, you know. I'm teasing, but really, I know that you're a model bishop, and I do mean that uh, from the heart. So I have a gift for you, but uh, in payment for the gift, I would ask you to pray for us. All right, so come forward if you would. You can come over on this side. And I'll give this rather than George. <laughs> there you are, you Thank you very much, beloved Father Joseph. Before we begin with our concluding prayer, if you will kindly indulge me, I would simply like to share from the heart how vivifying, how exuberant, and most of all, how sobering I found this evening's lecture, in addition to being a good friend with Father John, I share many things in common with him, the love for Irenaeus, whose name I do bear, and I also mention the martyr Blandina at every single one of my dismissals liturgically. Now if I could only learn how to say those dismissals in English, it would be a lot better. I applaud your boldness with which you have stepped forward, and I pray that your boldness will not meet condemnation so that you may continue to rightly define the word of God's truth. And thank you for taking holy tradition out of the formaldehyde in which it is so often placed mm -hmm. and pickled, but rather bringing it back to life. I think that was your very important contribution this evening. So let us pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, for having gathered us this evening here in fellowship. And we ask you to bless both the person and the words and the wisdom bestowed upon us through the person of Father John Baer. We ask you to bestow your blessings upon our president, Father Joseph, and upon those who teach here at the Orthodox Christian Study Center, Aristotle and George. Bless all of those who are here present as we walk on the path which has been set before us and leads to life itself. Heeding the words of Saint Sava of Serbia, whose 800th anniversary of consecration we celebrate throughout the course of this year, when he turned to one of his bishops, Irenaeus, and said, the East looks upon us and thinks that we are West, and yet the West looks upon us and thinks that we are East. But I tell you, Irenaeus, we belong neither to East nor to West, but only to the heavenly Jerusalem, which is above. Reiterating those words in 1921, the great Bishop Nikolai, standing before American church leaders here in New York City spoke of America and America's contribution to theology, stating that America is neither East nor West, but it is the youngest child of history which finds itself on the horizon between East and West with the ability to look and gaze upon Christ as the light of the world and that we are to be engaged nonstop in the competition for doing good, for such competition is indeed to our benefit. May we, as we embark and continue to go forward from that horizon where we find ourselves to the light itself, always be mindful of your transfiguration, your crucifixion, which brings us to the fullness of our humanity and then find ourselves in the light of the resurrection itself 
from this day forward to your greater glory and throughout all ages of ages. Amen.